Good afternoon everyone and welcome to Deep Discovery 2019. My name's Amber um, and this is my colleague Adrian and today we are here at the very very windy but very very sunny and warm Plymouth and we're in the Mayflower Marina so hello to all our friends at the marina and thank you for having us. We're on board the RV Callista, which is um, the University of Southampton's research vessel. And I did my undergraduate studies there in marine biology, and I got to go out on this vessel quite a lot. So we've got to know the crew quite well now. And we've got one of our crew members today, Gary. We'll give Gary a wave. He's our cameraman. Um, so yeah, like I said, we're here in Plymouth today, and this is my colleague, Adrian. And he's just going to introduce who we are and what we do for jobs. Well, thank you, Amber. And uh, yeah, I'm a marine biologist. I can't believe I get to say those words. It's just fantastic. It is like my dream job. Uh, I work at the Natural History Museum in London and also at the University of Southampton. And we're here on the University of Southampton research vessel. It's a very special boat where we can study the marine life uh, and all, all aspects of the ocean. So, so it's a real privilege to be here today. Well, it's very windy. We're not going to be outside the whole time. You're probably getting a bit of wind noise. Uh, so don't worry, that won't be the entire show. Uh, but uh, I'll try and shelter the microphone a little bit. Uh, but we're going to do something really exciting. We're going to actually deploy our mini robot submersible Rex, uh, what we call an ROV, remotely operated vehicle. We're going to deploy it to the seafloor. It's about 20 metres deep, straight down here behind the boat. Uh, and we're going to do that right now and see what we see. OK, so Adrian is a scientist, but also an ROV pilot. So Adrian's just going to run off indoors to go and start piloting Rex. And I'm going to go over to Regan and Dino, um, who are going to help us deploy our little our little friend Rex. So you off you go, Adrian. OK, so I'm just going to come down here. So this is our lovely little friend Rex. And this is Regan. Say hello, Regan. Hi. And this is Dino. Hello. OK, and they're going to tell us a little bit about Rex. So as you can see, Regan's just turned him round so that you can see all of his jazzy parts. So Regan, if you want to just tell us a little bit about different parts of Rex. This is the, this is the famous Rex. Um, and you can see it's a very small little uh, underwater vehicle, but it's got lots of stuff. It can do loads of stuff. Uh, we've got, uh, it's got lots of cameras. So it's got a big camera here, another big camera there, lights, a little manipulator. So it's like a hand where it can pick stuff up. Um, and it's also got these thrusters as well. So big kind of propellers, one on the top so it can go up and down and two big ones on the back which can push it forward uh, and back. Uh, we also have this big yellow tether. This is what connects it to the boat uh, so we can talk to it so that we can see what it's seeing uh, and so we can work it and control it. Brilliant, thanks Regan. And Dino, you've deployed Rex a few times now, haven't you? So what's it like when he goes into the water? Is it quite stressful? Is it fun? How, how is it? Is there anything you have to consider? Well, I guess you have to consider the uh, current strength. So sometimes when you deploy a Rex, uh, especially with wind like this, so it blows Rex right under our boat. So we have to uh, tell Adrian to pilot it forward, then adjust the tether just to make sure that it doesn't snag on anything. So it can be challenging, but it's definitely fun. And we've got a bit of an extra challenge at the moment, haven't we guys? Because usually we have a nice big uh, machine that helps us um, put Rex's tether into the water and it's broken so we have to do it all by hand so these guys are getting a really good workout at the moment so sorry about that guys so they're gonna have to put out 20 meters of cable now so I think once we're ready um, oh just on the age okay so we've just heard from Adrian that he's ready okay so Rex is about to go in the water now off onto his journey into the deep blue. There he goes. And that's Rex off. Okay, so we are now going to head inside to go to our Rex control center. So thank you very much, Regan and Dino. We'll come back to you later, okay? Hope it all goes okay out here. So we're just going back in to go and see Adrian now. And as I said, Adrian is our Rex ROV pilot. ROV means remotely operated vehicle, and it's a little underwater vehicle, as you've seen. And so Adrian is our pilot. And I promise what you're about to see isn't Adrian playing video games, even though it looks like a video games console. It's actually Adrian piloting Rex. So we've just, you can hear, there's a lot of uh, noise going on in the walkie-talkies at the moment. And it's quite 
important to have good communication between the pilot and the people deploying so they know how much tether to put out, whether there's any issues, uh, where the current direction is going. So, Adrian, um, how on earth do you pilot Rex? Okay, so I've got my fingers on some controls here. I'm currently flying Rex down through the water column. We've just gone down to sort of three or four meters. Uh, I'm maintaining a heading uh, so we can go left, right, up and down. Uh, the water depth here is about 20 meters. I've got to keep focused on the screen. Uh, it's quite a lot to take in. I've got a compass, which gives me a heading. I don't, when you're in the middle of the water, you don't have a lot of visual references. So you have to use the compass to know where you are and the depth to kind of give you an idea. I'm actually just going to bring my heading around a little bit east there. Um, so we're heading kind of, yeah, about just due east, which is just away from the boat. In fact, I might give us a little bit of south into that. Deployment's always a little bit tense. You know, you get a bit excited. Um, and yeah, we want to make sure everything's going okay. So I'm just going to call Regan. Yeah, Regan, how's the tether angle looking? Um, you're kind of going a bit far. It's like kind of in the bed, um, three meters away from the boat in the water. I'm kind of going a bit far, so. Yeah, copy that. Yeah, just keep feeding me. We'll just go straight down. Yeah, great, copy. So we're now down at about 10 meters, uh, just over nine meters. Ah, oh, and we've actually picked up a target on the sonar. So one of the things, because I can't see anything until we get to the bottom, uh, this is not you know, a tropical coral reef with 20 metres of visibility. But they say I've got a target right there on the sonar, uh, which could be one of the mooring lines going from the jetty. Uh, and I want to kind of avoid that. And then we'll get down to the bottom and just hopefully see a little bit of marine life uh, with the cameras. One of the things that we can do with Rex is film marine life in amazing detail. And you're going to see some videos that we shot out in the, the Plymouth Reef environment just beyond the breakwater. The southwest coast of the UK is covered in this amazing reef environments is huge numbers of different types of animals that live out there that are very rarely explored and Rex is really our, our eyes in the ocean that allows us to see some of these environments without having to dive down there. It's, water's quite cold, it's really hard to dive, uh, it's really something that only... Yeah copy that, uh, what's the tether angle over? So as you can hear at the moment, because we've got a short piece of tether, they are just trying to be very careful because we've got quite strong ocean currents at the moment. And this means that Rex's tether can get pulled quite a lot. So Adrian is trying to basically swim Rex in the opposite direction to where the current's going. Um, and that's why he keeps getting messages through from Regan, because Regan can see where Rex is. <gasps> we've seen a fish. That's very exciting. So we are now just on the bottom. Um, and I can just see, so in the pilot camera, which I can pan up and down, you can see the seafloor. And here we are coming in for a landing. There we go. This okay. is always the most exciting moment, isn't it, when it comes into view? Yeah, so there's the seafloor uh, down at about 17 metres now, just underneath the boat. Um, if I come back northeast a little bit, it might just give me a little bit of free tether. So sometimes Adrian and I actually um, go out on much deeper deep sea cruises um, and sometimes we end up having to send an ROV down maybe 4,000 metres which is about four kilometres below the ocean surface and it can take hours to get down that far maybe four or five hours to get all the way down there um, and so that moment when we hit the seabed here it's only taken us about five minutes but you think about the suspense and excitement we have when we see the bottom after we've been waiting four or five hours for that it really is quite exciting. Looking around the sonar to see if there's any targets that I can look for. I'm just going to go over this way. There's, there's the bottom there. So we're running the ROV. This little, it's got quite a short tether on today. Uh, so we're just keeping because we've got quite a lot of wind. We've got a lot of currents in the ocean. Uh, normally we have a much longer tether. The tether is the yellow cable you probably saw out on the back deck connecting us to the seabed. Uh, just seeing if we can see anything down here. Uh, there's something here. What's that? Let's just land next to that. It's a little bit of old rope or something. Let's, go, let's see if I can get down. A little bit buoyant. Okay, we'll just come back this way. Fraction. So what we're probably seeing right now is you'll see there's bits on the sea floor and actually a lot of these will be bits of rope and bits of netting um, and I know a lot of you at school are at the moment are learning about um, ocean pollution and so I know that you're t learning about plastics and things like that, but plastics don't just come from, you know, our plastic bottles and things like that, but they do also come from fishing and other industries like that where accidentally the nets end up in the sea. Um, so that's a lot of what we're seeing at the moment. So maybe that's another thing that you'll be thinking about when you think about ocean pollution. So Adrian's um, going to let us know if we see anything down on the seabed that means we've got to jump back over. But whilst um, he's having a poot around down there, we will show you what we've seen um, earlier today at different parts um, of Plymouth Sound. So we'll just head over to this screen over here. I've just landed on the seabed actually. 
Oh, oh, no, we have got on the seabed now. <laughs> so if you come onto this screen over here, you can see there's some mussel shells. And then directly ahead of me, uh, is directly ahead of me, uh, just moseying up to now, is an experiment that we put down uh, yesterday uh, with some, uh, there's a few mackerel attached to it. We actually, this is a long-term experiment we put down on the seafloor. Uh, I'm just coming up to it now to see what we can see. There's, nothing's found our bait yet. We've got some fish attached to the to the experiment. Um, so we'll have a look at that tomorrow uh, with students from the University of Southampton, which will be exciting. Uh, in fact, there's quite a lot of marine life on there. There's a little snail. Um, so we'll have a look at this, film that, and come back here. That's That little yellow thing in the middle is a temperature logger. And actually, yesterday we recovered that this experiment. We recorded the highest temperature we've had uh, in Plymouth area on the south coast uh, since 2013 since we started recording data here uh, so maybe indicative of climate change and in the um, experiment at the moment uh, what you may have noticed earlier and maybe if Adrian flies over it again in a moment um, we actually have some plastic cups we've got biodegradable cups and we've also got compostable cups in there and we've put them down as an experiment so that next year uh, when we do deep discovery, deep discovery with you guys again we can show you how all these different types of plastics degrade over time and which ones do and which ones we can buy that are better for the planet and which ones aren't quite so good so hopefully next year after they've been down that whole year in that crate you've just seen there we'll be able to show you um, how marine life and the ocean can break down ocean plastics so moving over we're just going to start recovering wrecks now so we're just going to start looking at some other stuff as i said earlier that rex has um, been looking at before so if we have a look at this screen up here this is how rex well, this is what rex's eyes see when he goes into the ocean and you can see it's very blue and very clear here in the surface waters and the reason um, that the water is blue is because we have different types of light that can get different um, amounts of distances into our ocean. So what you'll notice is a lot of things are very blue and very green. And that's because the red light completely disappears after a certain amount of meters. And what you'll notice is a lot of the images coming up now, you can see they're very green. But as soon as we turn Rex's lights on, we can see the true colours that marine life really is in the deep ocean. So a lot of people, when you think of the sea, we think of blue, we think of green. But really, there is a huge diversity of different colours um, and different types of animal in the sea that if we were down there using our human eyes, we wouldn't be able to see them unless Rex's lights were on. So here, um, this is... For really what most of the marine animals off the south coast will be living off and you can see it looks like a bit of a blizzard going on and that's because it's called marine snow and it's made up of all sorts of things uh, different bits of um, plants in the ocean called phytoplankton um, little bits of um, dead animals as well um, bits of dead fish and really excitingly most of it is made up of uh, feces which is another word for poo which is quite disgusting so most of these animals really are just living off other animals poo which is kind of disgusting so this guy here he's a spider crab and you can see his little mouth parts have been filtering and so that's what we call them we call them filter feeders who pick up this marine snow we have hard corals like this one with branches that also do filter feeding as well and they've got tiny tentacles on them which you'll be able to see that they use like little hands to be able to pick up different bits of marine snow from the water. And this is I think really exciting because you see we've got these really bright pink corals in our waters in the UK and most people think we only find them in tropical waters but we do get cold water corals here as well and they're really important to protect and we'll talk a bit about that later. So you can see here they've got all these branches and all these tiny fluffy bits are tentacles. And these are an animal that are related to them. These are uh, coralomorphs and they look a bit like coral, are a bit like coral, um, but they're just closely related and they've got all of these tentacles. They're called jewel anemones, but they're not anemones, it's a lie. They are related more closely to corals. And then finally, another type of filter feed that we have in these areas are um, these soft corals. And soft corals as well are just like the hard corals that you get that are branching, but they're just very, very squidgy and they've got a lot more tentacles. So you can see they look really, really fluffy. And if you look at pictures that we've got on our Rex YouTube page, you'll be able to count whether they have six or eight tentacles 
on every polyp here, which is what these are called, and that tells you what kind of species they are, whether it be an octocoral, which would have eight, or hexacoral, which would have six. So that's maybe an activity you can do with your teachers later. And that's how we identify animals, is looking at different things like this that are characteristics of them. So what we can see is these corals in these, uh, in these very what we call nutrient-rich waters, waters that have a lot of this marine snow, Lots of anim they happen in dense um, aggregation, so lots of them happen in the same area. And then other animals will move in um, and feed off all of the um, debris from the corals as well. So it's a very, very important ecosystem. In fact, there are fish that use them as a nursery habitat. And yeah, hiya, it's Rex uh, back. Yeah, Rex is back on deck. So awesome. we are, yeah, yeah, if there's any questions, things, I'm back here. So awesome. uh, yeah, that was a great dive. So yeah, so we're just looking at all the different reef building species here at the moment. So we've been through Fantastic, the different yeah. feeding types. So at the moment we're on filter feeders, all the different this um, was, corals. This was filmed off uh, Edderstone Reef, uh, off the Edderstone Lighthouse, off the south coast. And you just see these amazing corals, can't you? The Unitella varicosa, the pink sea fan. This is one of the most amazing things you can see uh, in the UK's reef habitats. Mm. Uh, really hard to get here. We're down at 36 metres. That's deeper than you can actually scuba dive comfortably. I mean, you can just about get there, but really, really hard. Rex is great, though. He can get there. We can stay as long as we want. <laughs> so, yeah, so another different type of um, feeder. So we've been through the filter feeders now. When this marine snow lands on the sea floor, um, that's where it's deposited on the floor. And so these are what we call deposit feeders. And they are continuous digesters, which means these big sea cucumbers basically just go along the sea floor munching up um, different bits of marine snow and continuously eating and continuously pooing. So you can always see where a sea cucumber has been because it leaves a trail of poo behind it the whole of its life which I think is really quite disgusting and then other sea cucumbers will come up and eat their poo and it's just it's just weird. I think they're a very strange a animal. There the is ocean. a lot of poo in marine biology, um, which they didn't warn me before I started studying it. So that was quite a shock. So then one of my favorite animals we ever see here are the spiny lobsters. And they really are amazing. And they're really, really rare. And that's because they've been overfished. So in the 1980s, 1970s and 1980s, they're really badly overfished, particularly in Devon and Cornwall. And they almost disappeared from our waters. But this year, in fact, last month, no, month before in May, we, they, Cornwall Wildlife Trust and a lot of other people scuba diving in Cornwall found spiny lobsters have come back with lots of baby tiny lobsters into um, Cornish waters. So that's really, really exciting. And there's a Is thing going on at claws? the moment. Yes, the yeah. Spiny lobster and the common lobster that we normally see, there's no, they don't have those great big pincers on the front. So when we saw this with Rex's camera, we were like, wow, that's fantastic. Oh, those beautiful anem anemones next to it. Another cool thing they do is um, these big antenna that you can see, when they are um, looking for a mate uh, to make babies, what they'll do is they use these antenna and they can rub them together. So if you were under the water whilst these guys were around, it would be so noisy. They're so noisy. And they rub them together and that's how they find a mate, um, which I think is kind of cute. But there's a big project by the Cornwall Wildlife Trust at the moment. Um, I think it's called a Hands Off Our Crawfish because that's a name, uh, the common name for, for these spiny lobsters. Um, so that we can make sure that now they're coming back to Cornwall and Devon's waters, let's not get rid of them again. Let's let them be a nice sustainable resource for us and so we can enjoy them and our children can enjoy them in the future. So yeah, I think we've got some questions come down now. Um, so if I just pass this to you for a moment. Okay, so what have we got from you? Oh my goodness, we've got a lot of questions. Okay, so question number one is from the year four class in Beacon Ace Academy in Bodmin. Hi guys. Hello. Uh, it's Mr. Rowe's class, I think. And the first question is from Senan. Um, no, sorry, we've got one from Morgan first, which is, how deep does the robot go? Adrian, you'll know this. Well, that's a great question, uh, Senan. Yeah, so Rex, our little robot, is actually can go to 300 metres. Oh my goodness. That's, uh, that's enormous. It's bigger than most skyscrapers. I think the, the tallest skyscraper in London is about 300 metres. Wow. Uh, so even deeper than, than that skyscraper is uh, under the ocean. Uh, so yeah, that's our maximum depth. It depends also, also how much of that yellow cable, that what mm. I call the tether we've got. Today we only had a short tether on there, so we're limited by that as well. But uh, yeah, you can go really deep. 
Awesome. So we'll let you know. We have been to some much deeper places with wrecks as well. Um, and if you go on our YouTube page, you'll be able to see we've been to Iceland, Bahamas. Um, where else have you been? Anywhere else? Or Yeah, we've been all over the UK coast. Uh, probably Iceland is probably the most exciting yeah. place we went. We were just there only two weeks ago. Uh, if you check out the uh, ROV Rex, Rob Rex Twitter feed, you can see some amazing videos from those dives that have just freshly posted. The deepest we've ever been is 180 metres. Uh, that was wow. in the place called the uh, Great Bahama Canyon, the Great Bahama Trough, just next to the, Baha the islands of the Bahamas. Wow. So go on our YouTube page and you can see Rex going on very, very deep adventures. So our next question is from Senan, uh, from the same Mr. Rose class. So hello, Senan. And Senan wants to know, how do jellyfish sting? So that's a pretty cool question. So jellyfish um, are a very, very strange animal. And what they have is they have particular cells within them that are called nematocysts. Uh, it's a very complicated word, but it basically means stinging cells. And so there's tiny cells within them that mean that they can shoot out little bits of their cell and that's how they sting animals around them. So a lot of different jellyfish have different adaptations. A lot of jellyfish obviously have those stinging cells only on their tentacles. So that's one way that a lot of the jellyfish that you would see would be able to sting us. But there are some jellyfish, um, some of them you might be on to Google called upside down jellyfish, literally look like someone's turned a jellyfish upside down. They're called Cassiopeia and they've got tentacles that come upwards. And when something scares them, they release a net of mucus mucus is basically snot so they release a net of snot which is really disgusting and that is full of these nematocysts these stinging cells um and i've actually been stung by those before all over my face and i looked awful um because my friend kicked them up underwater and they got scared um so wouldn't recommend it but yeah so they have stinging cells called nematocysts and that's how they Brilliant. they sting things i had no idea you're such a jellyfish expert <laughs> that's fantastic uh, i love jellyfish yeah. great obviously oh, we have a yeah, do you want me to hold that you want to read the yeah. next question okay. Okay, we've got uh, Watergate class of Charlestown Primary. Hello, everyone. We've got, we do lots of beach cleans and recycle. What else can we do to help marine wildlife? Do you want to answer that or do you want me to? Oh, or should we both? Yeah, we both answer. Well, you go first. Yeah, okay, what else can we do? so there's lots of different things you can do. Doing beach cleans and recycling, I mean, you guys are already amazing. You're already better than most of the people on this planet. So well done you. Beach cleans are great. Um, but one of the big issues is not letting it get into the marine environment in the first place. And so recycling is a really great way to do that. Also finding alternatives to single use plastic. Plastic itself isn't terrible, but single use plastic is. So when you go out and you have a McDonald's and everything's got plastic on and all these different kinds of things and you eat out of it and then you throw it straight away, that is where the issue is. So if we can find different things that we can use, maybe have reusable cutlery. So take a knife and fork made of metal with you and then you just wash it afterwards. I mean, it's what we do at home. So it's what we should be doing when I we're outdoors as well. Is one of the most <laughs> Everyone yes. loves washing up. Who doesn't love washing up? Washing up is one of the great solutions <laughs> to the problem of ocean plastic. The other thing to remember is of course, uh, uh, one of the biggest impacts that we have on our oceans is from the food we eat. And yes, we need to yes. get protein, uh, food and in, in meat form. I think a quarter of the world's meat or in the form of protein fish fish flesh uh comes from fisheries actually and that and that involves destructive bottom trawling and these kinds of activities which we want to have we need to be able to eat obviously uh but we have to think about how to do that in a sustainable way uh and one of the things there is looking out for eating fish which are uh, sustainably sourced yes. uh there's all kinds of schemes out there the marine stewardship council is one of the ones that run some of those schemes so that's good to to look out for and encourage you know think about carefully about how we eat fish and how we use fish uh, and shellfish uh, in our diet. It's something that we want to continue eating uh, and continue fishing. So yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Yeah, and leading on from what Adrian said, actually in Cornwall, there's a specific initiative. I think it's the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide, uh, which is made specifically for Cornwall. And so one thing we want to do is really eat local food because then it's not flown all around the world, which also harms the environment by having to use lots of energy and fuels. So if you have a look at the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide, that's made by the Cornwall Wildlife Trust, and you can find fish that you can eat that have been sustained sustainably sourced, won't be destroying the environment and aren't being flown halfway around the world to get to us as well. So that's something that you can do specifically in one, Cornwall. One, one important thing is also eating a better, uh, more types of different types of fish that we yes, wouldn't traditionally yeah. eat. One of the biggest problems in the fisheries around the UK is because we all want to eat cod or haddock or place or these types of traditional fish and it means a lot of other things get thrown back over the side because they're not wanted. Mm. Uh, so it's a really important thing is also to, to open our minds and increase the the idea of eating strange and unusual types of marine animals yeah. which might otherwise be thrown away from those fishing trawlers so that's another thing i think so a big message there don't be fussy eaters guys if we've got any fussy eaters in any of the classes 
You're not just being naughty, you're ruining the environment, so don't be fussy. More washing up and less fussy eating. There should be a sort of a theme here. Yes, (laughs) definitely. Okay, so we've got some more. Uh, What's this one? So many, so many. Some more coming in, fantastic, thank you. What is the rarest animals you have found? So you've done a lot of exploration of finding new species, Adrian. What, what, what would you say is the rarest animal you've found? Well, probably the rarest animal is a great question. The rarest and weirdest animal I've ever found is what we call the bone-eating snot flower worm. Uh, you mentioned snot earlier. I did. Well, I'm bringing snot, snot again. back snot again into the, uh, into the discussion. <laughs> the bone-eating snot flower worm is one of the weirdest things you've ever heard of. It eats whale bones on the seafloor. So wha- yeah, whales. So whales die naturally. They sink the bones, sink to the seafloor. Sometimes yeah. the entire whale actually sinks to the seafloor because they're quite big, heavy things. Uh, they get consumed. The flesh gets consumed by fish. And then in uh, 2005, we actually discovered a new species of, to science. Uh, we named it Ocidax mucoflorus, the bone-eating snot flower worm, because it, it actually looks like a flower growing out of the bone. Uh, and it's wow. really peculiar. It has no mouth, no gut. It feeds only on uh, the, the oily tissue inside the bones of whales how weird is that that is pretty weird okay i think that was a pretty good answer to that and i don't think you're going to meet many people that can say that they have described found and described a species so you've met someone pretty special today so another one we've got uh oh just thought i'd say that question was from willow and sam in morning school so thank you sorry i forgot to do your shout out Great one here from, oh what have you got? got a great one from discovery academy class nine that's a great name for an academy yeah. hi guys <laughs> um i think if i spelt if i've read that right oh biscove <laughs> it's right, Bisco. so, so we've got <laughs> yeah we've got a non-southwest person here yeah, sorry guys <laughs> londoner uh biscove academy class nine uh and millie has asked how many species of coral are found in the uk uh yeah. which is a really good question yeah uh and well really the coral's an interesting one because there are different types of coral but the coral you associate with a, a coral reef, like something like the Great Barrier Reef, is actually what's called hard corals. And there are, I think, as far as I know, I'm sure somebody on the internet will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I think there's only two species that we have here. The, mm. the Devonshire cup coral, which we've seen probably in some of these videos, actually. Uh, and another one, a sunset cup coral, uh, which there are some fantastic pictures that we've sent out on the, on the Roverex Twitter account. Uh, so it's super exciting seeing those. But they don't form those big reef environments. You only get that in tropical marine uh, uh, habitats. So yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and some of those cop corals, if you go rock pooling over this summer, you will see them in rock pools if you look really, really closely. So we've given you those species guides. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to print those out so you can use them over the summer. But the those um, cup corals, um, I found them lots. I'm from Newquay originally, so I find them on Fishtal Beach um, and all over the beaches in Cornwall. You, they're 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 very rare. But if you find one, it's really important to report them as well to um, things like the Cornwall Wildlife Trust because they're very, very special. Yeah got some great things out in the lab as well yes which might be good to look at so. yes so we will come back to more questions guys do keep sending them in any that we don't answer we promise we've got them all written down and what we will do is we will make sure that we send the answers to your teachers so that we can answer them for you so we're just going to head outside and what we started looking at is rex is um a sampling machine that can sem- sample animals called megafauna which sounds very dramatic but mega means big and fauna means animals so rex is able to take pictures of very very large animals but there are th- m- lots and lots of small species called macro and myofauna as well that live in our oceans and so we have to have special sampling techniques to be able to do those so adrian's going to talk us through one way we sample for those now so we've been looking at some of those big animals that we see with the Rex video screens. And I'm actually, uh, I'm a zoologist. I study uh, lots of animals in the ocean, but I really like little things. Little things that you can really only see with a microscope. And we're going to have a look at those now. So actually, I've got just down here. Do we need, uh, you want to kneel down? I think yeah. I can just hold oh, this up. Cool. So we've got a sample that we just took from the dockside, just of lots and lots of mud and seaweed and all kinds of gunk in there. And Regan, Dino, Amber and myself have been sieving this to look and see. What, so obviously, this is just seaweed. Uh, there's an egg case, other things. Okay, uh, yeah, big stuff. Uh, things like this as well, of course. Uh, lovely little sea star there. And those things, which are obviously fascinating, really important for studying marine life. But I like to sieve things, and sieving oh, means getting wet. That's all right. I've got my special this, boots on for sampling. Uh, this is actually just a really fine mesh, and with that, we can just pour things through there. Oh, just a little demonstration. Pour that through there. Oh no, I'm getting all wet. That's okay. <laughs> And I actually haven't got the proper equipment on. And what we're going to do is have a look at some of the things that we collect on our sieve under the microscope in a minute. Uh, but before that, I think I, just as a sort of uh, 
you know, to explain to people what it's like working on a boat. Uh, we're out here, you know, we're not, there's no big waves coming over right now, but when we were out at sea, uh, that there were big waves coming over, we have to wear loads of special kit, loads of special clothing to keep us warm and dry. And I think we've got a little demonstration of how that works. We do. We've got Dino here who, we're just going to get people to carry on sieving those samples so we can show them in a minute. But meanwhile, we're going to look at Dino who's looking very attractive right here, right now. Uh, Dino is wearing what we call oil skins today. Do you want to do a little catwalk for us, another little spin? So Dino is wearing uh, the very fashionable oil skins, which you will see many and fishermen wear, and a life jacket as well. Because if Dino falls over the back when he's putting uh, little wrecks in the water or collecting samples, we may never see him again if he wasn't wearing what that life jacket. If a wave came over, if a wave came over this might happen. <laughs> oh, poor Dino. Oh, it's all over me as well. <laughs> but are you dry, Dino? He's dry. He's completely dry. So that's why it's really important, not just for our safety, but also so we don't get super cold and wet when we're at sea. What we forgot about is the wind, and now we're both completely soaked. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, we didn't think about that. We are now absolutely drenched. Oh my um, goodness, we've got something in on the screen here. So these are some of the things. When we went through that sieve, Regan's now put these um, within a microscope. So off the sieve, straight into the microscope. Regan, what is this? This looks absolutely stunning. This is one of my favourite little animals you can get in UK waters, and... It's only about the size of a pea when it all curls up, um, but it's called a strawberry worm or spaghetti worm. Some funny words. Yeah. They're really tiny. Us, yeah, so this is my, you? this is my kind of finger there. You can see it in the dish there. It's not very big wow. at all. But then when you look at it on the big screen, you'd kind of think it would be from some big tropical reef. It's so bright and yeah. colourful. But that was literally just in the marina here, just in some mud. Um, and this is a really interesting little animal. So uh, lots of different complicated little parts so it's a lot more complicated than just the garden worm you'd find so you've got this lovely red body with all the spots up here uh, it's got its gills so they kind of look like cauliflowers these kind of ruffled bits of gills that it uses to uh, uh, breathe it uses to um, take oxygen out from the water it also has this big crown of tentacles so these kind of spaghetti like things and you can see it moving around and feeding and these are like having lots and lots and lots of different fingers and stuff so it's feeling around its environment it's touching it's tasting and in the wild it would build a little mud hole and use these kind of spaghetti like feelers to touch around feel its environment pick up bits of food and bring it back to its burrow so it's really really a lovely little animal that you can just find in the waters around the uk that's absolutely oh oh he had a nice little dance yeah, then didn't he right he's there, curled yeah. up there there we go so Without these microscopes, I mean, all you can see, you saw when we were close up to that um, animal just now, just looked like a little lump, but you put it under the microscope and it's absolutely stunning. So this is, again, the next stage in our sampling regime of what we call it. So you start with Rex, looking at the big animals, then you get the sieves and you look at the medium-sized animals, and then the really small ones that get stuck on the sieve, you put them in the microscope and you can see all these beautiful different parts of them. And we wouldn't know anything about this strawberry worm if we didn't have these kind of um, ways to sample marine life. So is this, yeah, is this the only one that we've got from the sieve today or? Um, yeah, so we're just yes, going to start yeah. to go through. So it takes yeah. a while to sort through the samples there, but this stands out. It's easy to pick out. And why does it take so long for us to, to go through samples? What What is it that takes really a long time in that process? Um, well, if you think of the size of the animals and the size of the sieve you're getting through, and if you've got, let's say, 20 in that tiny sieve, mm. you have to carefully pick them all out, carefully sort through it, have a look down, um, be able to identify it so we've got we have like books here to kind of help us identify it which have keys and uh, then you've got to take a record you have to make a big spreadsheet take oh notes all the time so it takes a lot it takes a lot of work so it's a slow process to really really get a good grasp of what lives in these waters when they're tiny so it's not like a big lobster you yeah. see you know it takes more work and you've been out on um, more deep sea cruises, haven't you? Yeah. Um, and I mean, when we're down here, we maybe take about what fifty or sixty species for our for our records and for our science. But how many do you end up taking when you go out on something like that? I mean, how long are you out there? How many of that? You know, that big spreadsheet. How many things end up in that? And um, so you can be out there for months. So if you think you're getting loads and loads uh, every day. Uh, um, over a period of months you can have thousands and thousands of samples and um, wow. by the time you get back so it takes a lot of work afterwards as well mm. to really go through them uh, but a lot of these areas are completely undiscovered or unexplored as well so you often find loads and loads of new species mm -hmm. new to science but to be able to describe a new species it really takes um, a lot of work after you sample them cool so if anyone's looking for a job when they're older and want to work in marine biology we need a lot of people describing species and that's called taxonomy so if anyone's interested in that you get to look at these tiny little animals and give them names which is you know 
super exciting we've even got not not that we've named but species in the world that've been named after david attenborough after bob marley all sorts of people we've got all sorts of names so you know you get to choose those which is super exciting so you might want to consider that so what we're going to do now is we're just going to go back on to doing your questions let's leave this lovely worm in the background while we're doing these questions because he's just stunning isn't he just wriggling around we'll put him back later Okay, so next I can see we've got some questions from Blue School. So I need to do a special shout out to Blue School because I went to your school when I was your age and now I'm old. But I did go to your school um, all the way from reception all the way through to year six and I loved it. So hi guys. Um, and what have we got? Do we have different types of wrecks? We do now, don't oh, we? That's a great question. Do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, so Rex is probably one of the smallest types of ROV, mini robot submersible you can buy, but you can actually get really big ones. We have one in uh, down at Southampton, uh, which can go to six and a half thousand metres. Wow. That's, that's almost, you know, you get to almost anywhere in the world's oceans. There's a few places in the world's oceans where uh, it drops down to about 10,000 metres, the so-called deep sea trenches. Uh, but 6,500 metres, oh, just think, that's almost as big as one of some of the highest mountains uh, there are in the world the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, is only eight thousand and a bit meters. Uh, so that and re and that that ROV, it's really big. It's almost the size of a, a truck, actually. Oh uh, you need a big ship, a hundred <laughs> yeah. meter long research ship, about ten people to deploy it. It's but it's actually very similar. All the principles are the same yeah. as when we deploy Rex, uh, just just off the small ship here, Callista. And then Rex has got other kind of friends that aren't ROVs, but what they're called is AUVs. So that means an autonomous underwater vehicle. So Rex, it's really important that we have pilots like Adrian to be able to drive him around and he's got a tether. But with an autonomous underwater vehicle, it's like you think automatic, like automatic doors. You walk up to them and they open on their own. Well, it's the same thing with autonomous underwater vehicles. And they just poot around the ocean. They'll go away for 24 hours and come back and bring you all this data. And you do coding and you tell them where to go and they come back and they can map. They can take samples. They can tell you the uh, different temperatures of the sea. And a really good example of one of these, which what you guys may have heard of, would be Boaty McBoatface. So if you want to go and look up Boaty McBoatface, he's currently out on adventures um, from the Oceanography Centre in Southampton, where I currently work, actually. So Boaty's out and you can follow the adventures of Boaty McBoatface. So he's definitely one of Rex's bigger bigger brothers really isn't he much bigger than rex oh could i get to answer, ask the next question you do <laughs> <laughs> so um harvey at saint hillary's hello saint hillary says why do octopus have eight tentacles it's a tricky one isn't it uh, uh, so that's why you wanted to ask <laughs> that question because you didn't want to answer it i yeah. see i don't know i don't know why they have eight tentacles i don't know what it is that means eight is particularly that's right it's interesting is it because yeah. squid of course have eight tentacles plus two feeding tentacles yeah. these are feeding uh, i mean i guess that some of these things I mean, it's an evolutionary question really mm -hmm. what you're asking is how uh did this how has an animal adapted to its marine environment obviously eight tentacles allows it to move around over structures on the seafloor octopus are famous for being able to get into little crevices uh, those tentacles they also use for feeding, of course, yeah. bringing food to their mouth. Uh, but somewhere, hundreds of millions of years ago in evolutionary history, uh, by chance, possibly a little bit of a, a little mm. bit of chance, but also quite a lot of natural selection, evolutionary processes. Eight seemed to be about the right number yeah. uh, of appendages to be able to do what you needed, and it, and they probably get stuck with it. Uh, and that's why they have those uh, number of appendages. It's a, really, it's a great, uh, great question. <laughs> a really tricky yeah, one. That we can't really give you the full answer for, other, other than evolution chose it that way. And obviously it's got a reason that we just don't understand yet in science. So again, any of you want to be marine biologists, go and do a project on that and tell us the answer. We've got another one from Biscovay. So Jonas at uh, Biscovay Academy, not Discovery Academy. <laughs> uh, my terrible that reading. That should be a Discovery Academy. <laughs> it would great. be a great name. Uh, have you seen a great white shark? Have we seen a great white shark? Um, well... Uh, I can answer a little bit of that. When we were diving in the Bahamas, we actually filmed a lovely nurse shark came right up. It was a big shark, not a great white, but it came right up to Rex's camera. Mm. And on the Re on the Rex YouTube channel, you can see that. Um, I think it's Rex Dive 007, which I thought was appropriate. The seventh dive we ever <laughs> did, uh, the, with the Bond theme one, we actually saw a shark, uh, which was great, in the Bahamas. So yeah, I don't, I have, no, I've never personally seen a great white shark. Have you ever seen one in the waters at all? or? No, 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 I haven't, no. Uh, but I mean, they, are, they do get around. They're Maybe. quite a globally distributed animal, but there are certain places where we're more likely to see them than others. If we see them, we'll let you know. Okay, what have we got next? We had all of these. Uh, what have we got? Oh, my goodness. So many. Why did you want to become a marine biologist? That's, oh, that's from Blue School as well. That's a great one. Oh, yeah. guys. So 
I wanted to become a marine biologist. I was at Blue School when I decided I wanted to be a marine biologist and I was watching Blue Planet because I'm old enough that basically when the first Blue Planet came out, I was in Blue School, so I was alive when that happened. You guys weren't. And the first Blue Planet came out and it was Sir David Attenborough. And all the lovely pictures and everything, yeah, that was great. You know, there was lovely pictures of animals and I really enjoyed that. But at the end, it has the diaries bit. And that's when I saw, well, all the people that get to look at this cool stuff every single day, that's where they told me they were called marine biologists. And so I went into my teacher when I was in year two and we were all like, being asked what we wanted to be when we were older. And I said, a marine biologist. And yeah, yeah, I think there's probably a similar story for all of us. You just see the amazing diversity of life in the sea. And most of us do it because we want to learn about it, but also because we want to protect it. And that's really important because there's so many different things putting pressure on the sea at the moment. You've got, you know, eating too much fish and overfishing. You've got plastic pollution. We've got oil being taken from the sea, new industries, which is um, what I do some work in called deep sea mining, um, which is looking to take minerals for our iPhones and things from the deep sea. And I always knew I just really wanted to do stuff that protects yeah. the environment. You don't, you don't always know what you want to do. I mean, my story yeah. is a little bit different. I never really thought about being a marine biologist. I just thought I wanted to do something science related, went to university to do biology. I thought that would be interesting. Which Suddenly at the end of my course, I was, had the opportunity to go diving scuba diving uh, to collect data uh, as part of my university degree and the sort of the rest is history I thought well, this is great I'll try and stay involved in this it's, a, it's fascinating and it's creative and a really interesting mm. thing to do so um, yeah maybe we're that's probably we're getting close to the wrapping up aren't we, yes, we don't I think so. let's do a couple more questions yeah. um, and then all of the other questions I will make sure that we do give you the answers um, by email have you ever found an animal that has been stuck in plastic um with wrecks i don't think we have but i think probably you know we all spend a lot of time by the seaside and yes we do see it a lot and probably you guys when you go to the beach will probably see it too and it's not just plastic um as well there's all sorts of different things that things get stuck in so it's really important that i know the schools that do beach cleans and things like that if you're going out and making sure you're taking that out of the environment then that's really great and we'll find less animals stuck in plastic and if you're making sure you're making choices like recycling and avoiding single use plastics that stop that plastic getting into the sea in the first place, um, then you're also doing your bit to make sure we find less animals that are stuck in plastic yeah. as well. So I think we're going to have to wrap up now, guys, because I know that it's coming to the end of school um, and you're going to need to start packing up and tidying up and let your teachers go home. Um, but it's been a real delight speaking to you all today. Promise we will answer the questions that we didn't um, answer on air today if you've still got more coming in and want to send anything in or you think anything over the weekend and want to ask us next week i'll be on my email and we'll all sit and answer your questions um but yeah we will be back next year we promise and we will uh let you know when that will be but it'll be around the same time and yeah thank you so much for joining us yeah thank you for joining uh yeah deep discovery 2019 yes. and we look forward to seeing you uh, next time in 2020 and keep the questions coming in yes. visit the YouTube channel visit the Twitter account uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already done yes. so because that helps us it makes our lives a bit easier uh, connecting things and up with for this kind of broadcast so thank you yeah we'll post stuff through the year so that you don't have to wait until next year to see more cool stuff that Rex has done so cheers guys take care and we'll see you all soon bye, bye.